Thank you very much for joining us in our second Historical Heartbeats Lecture Series for 2011-2012 uh, series. Um, we're very fortunate today to have preeminent Bermudian artist who really needs no introduction, but I'm going to introduce her anyway, <laughs> Ms. Sharon Wilson. Uh, Sharon Wilson was born in Bermuda in 1954. She graduated from the Massachusetts College of Art with an MS, uh, excuse me, a Master in Science in Art Education and a BFA in Illustration and Graphic Design. In 2009, she was awarded the Queen's Certificate and Badge of Honor for her contribution to the arts in Bermuda. When asked to describe the significance of art, she writes, as an artist, I attempt to take feelings and give them a face. Then I say to the viewer, have you ever felt like this? Or do you know this person? Sometimes I yearn for a peaceful, quiet places in my life. So I consider all the ingredients needed to create a peaceful space. That is to say the age of the model, the setting, the time of day, the colors, and on and on. And these things I call the ingredients. When I am successful, the viewer experiences and feels that which I intended him to feel. He is triggered to feel more peaceful, more nurtured, more hopeful. I believe that which makes and keeps us human must be fed and nurtured. Sharon Wilson's studio is located at 2 Turtle Place in Southampton near Tio Pepe Restaurant, and she encourages all to please call and visit her at some point. So without further ado, please welcome Ms. Sharon Wilson, Uplifting the Human Spirit. Thank you. Thank you. Good evening. It's nice to be here. It's really nice to be here. I have, I suppose, over the years given lots of slide presentations to different ages of audiences. And I have never felt as blank as I felt this, this evening standing in front of you. It's very interesting as we uh, grow and change how what yesterday was familiar, today is unfamiliar, and vice versa. I find the growth process very, very interesting, and I thought I would share that with you. I'd like to think of this evening's conversation as a conversation more than me just delivering information to you, as a conversation. Because for so many years I worked, and I worked in isolation. I stayed in my studio for hours and hours, and then I would mount an exhibition at the end of a year, and there would be a rush of people coming on opening night, too many people to talk to, and then you wouldn't see me again for another year. And I suppose the years of working like that were good in one sense, but they lacked something else. They lacked connection with the audience that I paint for and paint about. I had to write something for community and cultural affairs. I don't know where it was meant to be published. And was it? Okay, uh, it's, coming out. it's coming out. Well, I'm going to read a little bit of it because it's a nice preamble, I think, for where I want to go this evening. I never imagined that I would need to define what it means to be an artist, either to myself or to others, but I do. This is because we live in very strange times. Anyone can call himself an artist today, and many do. There are singers that cannot sing, writers who cannot write, and visual artists who have convinced themselves that anything they do is art, and therefore is protected and cannot be criticized. As an artist, I attempt to take feelings and give them a face. I say to the viewer, have you ever felt like this? Or do you know this person? People can take this argument and it can go on and on and on, but we're going to keep it pretty short tonight. Art is predominantly about feeling. It 
doubt, it lives in the realm of emotion. It's what separates it from the sciences. It appeals to our emotion. That is its primary intent. So when you hear people say, well, artists are all feely, feely, and it makes some people feel uncomfortable, but that's the part of the soul that art is meant to tap into. Now, art can be, it can be intellectual, but in its natural sense, it is not an intellectual thing. It is a feeling-driven thing. I'll give you an example of it becoming an intellectual exercise. The story was told to me once in college that there was an exhibition intended to be mounted in, uh, in New York City. And the people arrived for the opening night, and they were meant to stand outside until the ribbon was cut and the doors were open and they were meant to go inside. So they stood there, and 5.30 came, and they should have opened the doors, and they didn't. Instead, a man came to the door and he said, ladies and gentlemen, the artist of the evening is a little late. He just called to say that he is presently at 52nd and 5th Avenue, and his estimated time of arrival is 25 minutes. The artist has just called to say he's at 48th and 5th, and his estimated time of arrival is 15 minutes. And this went on and on until the artist arrived. That ladies and gentlemen, was the art. I would not have enjoyed somebody throwing that at me. Cute, it's a mind bender, it's a head game, but it isn't art. So when I think of the kind of art artist I am, I have called myself a social commentator, and that by itself doesn't say a lot necessarily. Because a social commentator can be a person that just documents events. There was a fire over there, I painted a fire. There were people marching over there, I painted the people marching. I could just document events. And that's the way artists were used before the invention of the camera. They were used to document events. At least that was one of the uses of them. I could be a social commentator who looks at a society and sees where the hot spots are. Oh, people look like they're all riled up over that. I think I'll paint about it. I will touch the sore spot in the community. I will, I will maximize, I will, I will exploit it. In that case, the artist maybe is using his art in a very, very political way to achieve a specific end. But I think that I primarily am responding to human nature rather than nature. I don't paint much about trees and things like that, but human nature, the way that people in this society respond and behave and live and have their being. So a social commentator that has at the forefront front of my thought is always about human potential and about what it takes to sustain and nurture that part of your soul that often feels so beaten down in the everydayness of life. I think it's important that I define for you this evening who and how I see myself functioning in a society. You, of course, must choose for yourselves how you see me. Unless you understand something about the artist, you understand nothing about his work. You have got to understand something about what gave birth to the artist. If I were born, let's suppose I painted pictures and you your feeling about the pictures were that they were cold and unfeeling and they left you with a feeling of isolation. 
And then you found out later that I was born during the Depression era. How much would that change the way you view the art? You still might not like it, but you might understand it better and you may be able to respond to it from a different perspective. And I'm saying that because without the viewer, the artist really cannot produce art. I mean, if I do something and nobody sees it, is it art? Art is a language. It's about communication. It's about I put something out, you respond to it, and there's a, a, a conversation that goes on, a, a visual conversation back and forth between the artist and the viewer. And tonight's talk is a little bit different from others. Normally when I do a slide presentation, I show you maybe 40, 50 slides. And tonight is not really so much about my bombarding you with lots of images and saying this is what I did that's new and this is what I did that's new, but rather to have a conversation with you about what makes me produce the art that I make. What is the thought behind it? Because there are a lot of myths surrounding the artists. This feeling that they're these incredibly talented people and that they were born with this magical gift and that they just think about it and it just flows and runs out of them and this, this magic. And we love to believe in magic. And even when people tell you the truth, you prefer the magic. I suppose there is a magic in it, but it really isn't that magical at all. So tonight I have uh, tried to divide up the few slides that I have into categories. And these are areas that I have been giving, given particular thought to in, um, in recent times, like in the last year, year and a half. So, let us begin. Let's see if I can remember. Advancing on this one? All right. Okay, we have a, a bride and her and her mother. I, I'm going to be eliciting some responses from you, so you're not going to get a chance to sit back and be all that passive tonight. Um, how many people in this room feel that so many things are shifting and changing right now that it feels like you're standing on shifting sand? Uh, between global news that's bombarding you, most of which is bad, um, economic woes, and how many people just feel like, where is the constant? Or how much constant is there in my life? Just raise your hands. Anybody feel like that? Do you feel when you're on the road that people are like either very reckless or that something, do you feel, do you feel the tremble and the, do you feel the shifting sand? Do you feel it? It's real. It really is real. It, it, is, it is a pervasive feeling that is rippling um, um, out. And in the face of that, there's one looks around for where is the stability. And one thing about the marriages and deaths, funerals, births, and marriages are the constant, and everything else is up for grabs. So I'm going to ask you as you look at this mother and child, can anybody, don't be nervous, tell me what the deal is in this picture. What's it about? What's going on? Just shout it out. She looks like a very young girl. Young bride. She's protesting something. Who's protesting? The bride. The bride is protesting? She understands her posture, her, her arm is down, her, she's almost backing away. What do you think her mother's saying? What, what, what is the role of the mother there? Last word. Huh? Advice. Pardon? The last bit of advice. What, what, is, what, what is she telling her? What is the advice? Who said that? I'm not saying that. Mothers never say that. Okay, I'm, I'm, I'm glad you said that because that, that brings me to a conversation. 
about last words, and that's what this is, last words. I teach um, a group of women, well, there's one guy in the group, but really I teach a group of women. And we're an interesting group, a little smaller than we used to be, but an interesting group. And we are white women and we are black women. And we are Bermudian and we are born of other countries. And when this picture was painted, for some reason the conversation came up while we were painting about getting married. And I said, well, if it's a black mother and she's from Bermuda, she's probably saying to her daughter, are you sure you want to do this? I don't care how many people are waiting out there for you, you can change your mind now. If you want to have a party, you can go have a party, but are you sure you want to do this? And then a white woman who was Bermudian said, you gotta be joking, that wasn't the message that came out of my house. Said it wasn't, because of course we all think the world, we're the satellite and the world is whatever is common to us. You see, that's the big myth. We think we're the norm and everybody else is the exception. And she said to me, no, white Bermuda family said, you made this choice, I don't care what happens, you're gone, you're out of here, make it work. I was like, ah! <laughs> and then gradually, the women from other countries weighed in on it. What they had to say about what the mothers say. We're all looking at the same picture. Do you realize what's happened? We all bring our own story to the picture. Pay attention to that. Oh, that's an important point we're going to come back to later. We bring our story to the picture. We talked this evening about what is the value of art. Oh, yes, yeah, nice. So, yeah, well, you know, she would talk about it like that because she's an artist. What is the value? What is the intrinsic value of art and what does it do for us? It's funny because if I were to ask you to consider a writer or um, a filmmaker, we know that the filmmaker picks a character and then he throws that character, he puts them in a place and he gives them a set of problems to resolve. And we sit on tender hooks to see how he will resolve it at the end of the day. But when it comes to pictures, people don't see it quite in the same way. They seem to make a separation between what happens in music and what happens in theater and what happens in, 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 in paintings. But it's the same thing. It makes sense that we bring our story to it. Our story is the only story we know. Who else's story can we bring to what we see? Until we learn differently, we say, well, that, I, that reminds me of that. Her head seems to be saying, are you sure you want to do it? Somebody else is looking at the same gesture and saying, her mother seems to be saying, I hope you'll be happy. Somebody else is saying, so that's the story. And that's one of the beautiful things about art is that there, there, is, a, there is a universal something and then there is the personal story. And then there is the opportunity through the art to then learn new ways to relate to each other. Because those women that sat in the art class that went, oh, have now learned something. Where did they learn it? They learned it because they all looked at that, talked about that, and shared what they thought they saw with each other. We want to talk about the power of art. It's real. Let's go to the next one. John Wilson's been painting since, I don't know. Prince came out probably in the very, very early 80s, so it's been a while. And images of children are the thing that I suppose I will always be most known for, paintings of children. But why I paint children, I think, may hugely be misunderstood. 
I didn't only paint children because I was a school teacher and had children in front of me. I paint children because we are every child we see. The adult does not reside in the child, but the child still lives in the adult. <coughs> and if you doubt that that is true, you let somebody press the right button. That old five-year-old in you will rear itself up. At 88, at 98, at 108, it's still there. And you know what else? All the pain it experienced <laughs> is still there which is not altogether a bad thing. What it can allow us to do is to be empathetic because we have been there, because we have felt it, because we have touched it, so we remember it. Um, that's huge, really. So, I have people that come back and they say, well, Sharon, how come your ch children ain't smiling at us? They just seem so sad. They're not toys. Children are not toys. They are people. And they have every emotion known to man. They may not have the language for it, but in their DNA, they have it all. And it's a myth that they have these unencumbered lives that they go through and their life is happy and lighthearted. You should listen to them sometime. They worry about saving face. They worry about not being accepted. They worry about somebody talking about their mama. They worry about you knowing the truth of what goes on in the house. They worry about covering up. They worry about not having enough. They worry all the time. They worry a lot. They worry because we worry. They are our mirrors. So why do I paint children? When you look in his face, what do you see? He's there to remind us of who we, who we used to be. He is there to remind us, perhaps, to temper how we say what we say. You want to know what the power of art is? It should be there in all our spaces to remind us every day about what's important, about what we want more of in our lives. How do you, we all know we want the good stuff, but how do you get it? Well, you don't get it feasting on a diet of junk. You're still trying to match your drapes and your curtains? Still doing that, huh? Still want some blue in it to go along with your curtain? You don't understand. You don't understand the power of imagery. You don't understand that, that I know what kind of person I want to be. But I forget. I can't concentrate on it all the time. So I forget. I temporarily forget. But when I look up on the wall, it reminds me, oh, yeah, I don't want to talk like that. I really don't want to be that kind of person. I really want to be a more open person. Let me take a deep breath and let me take five minutes and let me come back again. That's the power of art. And if it's not on your wall to remind you, what will remind you? How will you be reminded? The kind of music that you choose, the kind of lyrics contained in the music. You don't need an interior designer to come in and design a space for you to live in. You need to design the space you live in. You know what you want. You know how much craziness there is between your gate and your job? And your job and your gate. A space, how do you create a space which is 
a safe haven, which is a comfortable place, with music that soothes you, with images that inspire you. Inspire you to do what? To get up and do the difficult job of creating and living the life you want to live. See this little boy? I taught him. And every day I look at the, his, his, his picture, I say a little prayer and hope that someone greater than me is looking out for him. He happens to be a marginal child, so on the edge, just on the cusp. You can see it in his face. Not quite so innocent anymore, not quite so accepting of everything you have to say. You know what title I gave this piece? Invictus. How many people know the poem Invictus? The last words in that poem, I am the master of my fate. I am the captain of my soul. For every child I have a toy, for every child I see hanging around, waiting to be entertained, waiting to be picked up by somebody who's shocking for young kids. If each of them could understand that if you are the master of your fate and the captain of your soul, then you're well taken care of. You have to make the decisions for yourself. We say we want this for our children, but we act like we don't want it for us. You can't want one thing for them and then be a different person. They just watching us. They just watch us. What did the paint? The painting is there to remind us that they're watching us. Do you beginning to understand what I'm where I'm coming from? It's not about a pretty picture. A picture may be beautiful, but it may have greater worth than sheer surface beauty if it can inspire you every time you look at it. You say you can't afford it, you can't afford not to have it. You're getting a diet from ABC News every day. They can't make it bad enough because good news don't sell news. Got to be bad. And then if you're not careful, you know what your friends do? They call you up and with five minutes of the conversation, it's going negative. And you keep hashing over the negative over and over and over. You got such a diet of the negative until you don't know if there's any hope in the world anymore. How do you turn it around? Not magic. Not really magic. OK, so those that you just looked at were images that were from what I called the gold collection. And the gold collection was a collection of paintings that I began more than a year ago because there had been so much in the news with the shootings, with the everything, with the, you, do you notice that there used to be 16 year olds that used to race bikes? You notice they don't race bikes anymore? You don't hear about a bike, nobody, they ain't racing bikes no more. That's gone. Did you notice that it was gone? Yeah. But you didn't even notice. They don't race bikes no more. 16 year olds, now the 20 something year old, and he's doing something different. Things are changing. So I, I ask myself as an artist, how can I be a force for something positive without talking down to the people? Without making it sound like they're being blamed for something. It's like we, take, we took our eyes off the ball we lost control. Then we beat ourselves up because we took our eye off the ball. We still haven't put our eye back, back on the ball yet, but we're doing the beating up, the beating up ourselves now. But none of that is going to give us a way forward to creating an island that we want, a neighborhood that we want, a home that we want. And I said, there must be a way to take what I have learned in 30 years 
and what I have learned from being in the classroom, there must be a way to take what I have learned and marry it together and create a product that you can then hang in your homes and in your offices, which will begin to change the climate, the way you think some of the time. So that's what the Guru Collection was about. And it's a collection that is ongoing. I, I will continue to add to it. The original 14 paintings are gone, but I still do. And will continue to add to that collection. Before I go on to the next section, does anybody have any questions so far? So you don't have to hold your question until the very end. Is there anything that you want any clarity on? Yes, I was going to ask, uh, the way I look at a picture reflects, I suppose, some of my background. And therefore, I would interpret it one way to compare with someone else. Now, I looked at that last picture as you were uh, showing it there. And I thought I saw hope. That was the first thing I saw. I could see that perhaps there was some bad times, but I just saw a glimmer, a light, a little bit of light. And so my, 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 my mind concentrated more on the hope until after I heard you <coughs> explain and speak, then I saw a sullenness in his eyes. So I was swayed just a little bit. Now, what I'm wondering is if <coughs> My first thing is just what I keep. That's, that's interesting. The benefit of understanding with what motivates the artist to paint is one bit of information that you have. There's, there's lots of kinds of information that you can have when you're looking at art. Your immediate gut response to it, that's that's what you're getting from it. What you understand about me is not so much whether or not we read an individual work the same way or not, but often when you talk about an artist's work, you talk about a collection of work. And when you see a body of work, it reads very differently than a piece in isolation. Say, why does Sharon Wilson paint so many children? Why does she paint so much about this? How come her stuff is this? How come it never has a background in her picture? How come she never painted any landscapes? Well, if you understand what motivated her and drove her to produce the work, then you don't, those questions are answered for you. You say, oh, I understand why she does that. So it gives a context for the work. But your gut response to the work, that's what speaks to you. That's what you're getting from it. That's what matters. So in other words, what I understand from that is that my <clears throat> looking at your collection is like reading a book, so to speak. I'm learning you through that collection of art. Like you say, I'm looking at the commonalities. There's no background, and I'm trying to find out what it is you're saying through the collection. Is that, is that the idea? Well, you know, the reason I'm having this dialogue is because most people say, They'll whisper that they don't like a piece, but they never have the confidence to say it out loud because they always feel like, I don't know enough about art to say that. And I'm going to say it, and then somebody's going to come back with a sharp retort, and I'm not going to be able to answer them because I don't have that economic background. And what, what I'm here saying tonight is you don't have to. An academic discussion about art is not the only valid way to begin to discuss art. We need to get away from that. Because it's about emotions, you have as much right, you feel as much as anybody else, speak to the emotion of it. But what I'm saying is that to do that and have no knowledge of the artist, well, sometimes you can't get information. But whenever you can, and you can get at an artist, you should begin to question them. And if they're not about much, you shouldn't waste your time with it. Because until you demand more, 
you're not going to get any more. So I went and saw that artist's work. I asked her, well, why did she do She says, well, it was there. It was like, really, you know. I don't know. You say, right, not a no either. I'm out of here. <laughs> right? Um, okay, so the next, um, the next grouping of paintings, I suppose, are those that deal with, um, situ I guess, situational. You know, my mom always come in and say, I went in the store to get served, and it seemed like they just don't even want to serve you. you. You know how we are. And, and, and then we went through a period where we were very protective. We didn't like to be criticized. That, and we didn't like to have it said out loud that we, the sales clerks don't seem like they want to serve us. They don't want to serve us. You know, what you want? No, we ain't got none. They don't tell you that they don't have any before you even said what you want. What you here for? What closing? What what? What you want? This is what you want. And the thing is that when, when we're in the midst of that, your pressure goes up, you get so angry, you want to know where's the manager? You are the manager? You know, and you go home and then somebody drives stupid on the road and you just keep getting wrapped up and wrapped up and wrapped up. Well, what does the art do? Well, art creates a little bit of distance between you and it so you can laugh at it instead of punch the sales clerk up. <laughs> you can just say, yeah, well, that's my people, my people, oh, my people. <laughs> And then more than that, you know, it gets to hang in your house and people come in and it becomes the kind of image, the image that evokes discussion. So I painted this and it's really funny and I had some of my students be the models for it and then photograph them and then paint it from it. So like, she's on the phone, you know. You know. So. So art can serve that purpose for us as well. And that's the kind of thing I'm going to add to. It took me a long time to get to that. Um, a long time to, you know, what is Bermuda? This place seems so unique sometimes, so strange, you know. We're probably the only island or the only place in the world where you've got to have minis, you know, you've got to have Hellman's minis. And you get upset if people don't say good morning, but you don't care if they say good afternoon or good night, it's just good morning. <laughs> I mean, you know, we are a little, you know, a little. So how to paint about how to really understand. You can't, I, one of the things I've learned is I cannot be a good artist unless I learn to think clearly. You think that art is about, then I have to figure out what am I really looking at. Then I have to distill it. If it was a movie, I would have like an hour and 20 minutes to tell the story. I have one frame to tell the story. So I have to distill the idea down and then I have to find out what's the best elements to put in there so that most people will be able to read the picture accurately. It's not as much magic as you think. It is actually a lot of very concrete, very slow, plodding thinking that goes into the making of a piece of art. But that's the second area. After the girl collection came a series of paintings about fathers and sons, and that came out of the same thought that the gold collection came. How do I find a way to show men in a positive light? And again, discussion comes up in the art room, and I said, well, in the black community, we have a unique set of circumstances where fathers are concerned. And the white people say, well, it's not that unique. We, we have it too. You know, you know, not the same thing. Not coming from the same place. Not happening in the same, uh, to the same extent, the number of families where there are not fathers. And I had a cousin come up to me lately and he said, you know, 
It's hard to be a good daddy if you didn't have somebody be a good daddy to you. So yeah, it's a big challenge. It's a huge opportunity as well. It's like trying to understand and value art when your parents didn't collect art. It feels foreign to you. It feels not a part. It feels like it's for other people can afford it more. It seems like what we do is we don't buy vitamins for ourselves because they're too expensive. But we save up our money and go to Disney World. Do you know what I mean? Like what we really need to feed ourselves, we deny ourselves of because we don't really believe that we could justify expending that much money. So we don't buy what we need and then we take the money and we buy something else that doesn't do the job for us. If you didn't get a chance to sit on your daddy's knee, make sure your child sits on your knee. It's a huge chance to turn it around. And then go find some friends that have made up their minds that they're going to let their son sit on their knee. And a whole bunch of you together have a club. Children sitting on your knee. You want to know how to change behavior? It's not magic, you know. It's just practice. It's practice and being reminded. And practice and being reminded. And the women know why we need it. So we stop saying negative things about the dead is all in front of them. We might not need them anymore, but they do. See them out there in the street right now. He may be crippled, and he may be, he may be limping and one-eyed and whatever, but if he still got breath, those children need him still. If there's anything in him left, they need it. And he gets a chance to be a king for what? Just Spend some time doing that. You get to be king in somebody's eyes. My daddy. So as a community, we need, and I don't know the white story. I know that we have common issues, but I know the black story. And I know the necessity right now for images like this that will encourage. And if you have an office and you happen to be a business person, you own your business, that means you don't have to get the okay from somebody else. Buy a picture like that and put it in your office. And see how it impacts your employees. See how much more respect they have for you, the white Bermudian. That thought to take that and put it on the wall instead of welcoming arm steps. Do you think that's talking to anybody today? We either find a way to be a part of the solution, or we're all going to do a lot of running and a lot of hiding. Because this is a very, very small space. The plus about a small space is that we know so many of each other that if we have it in our minds to do it, we can do amazing things in a short period of time because we are small. Can you find the courage to put that on your wall or are you concerned about how your friends feel about you putting that on the wall? What kind of investment is that for a business to decide? I try to talk to the banks. I'm saying when people stand in line in a queue waiting to be served, does it not make sense that the images you put on the wall should speak to them? So instead of bitching about the uh-huh, you nudge the person behind you and say, look at that. Girl, I know about that. What you do? I know. What did you do? And it sparks dialogue. That is the nature of art. That's what it's meant to do. Bridge the gap. Break down barriers. That's the power of it. And then neighborhoods about neighborhood, community, and how people behave in neighborhoods. Well, that's the Jehovah's Witness at the door. That was the topic of it. <laughs> because when I thought about neighborhoods, I thought, what do I know about neighborhoods? What about neighborhoods in Bermuda? What's different? 
What about Naples? And I thought, oh, Jehovah's Witness always come to the door when I'm teaching. And so I'm trying to find a way to paint about neighborhoods in a real way. A house that looks like somebody lives there. A road that looks like maybe you argue with your, with your, with your neighbor because they take the trash out at the wrong time. We have big fights in my neighborhood because people, the, the guy comes to collect the garbage and two minutes later somebody's coming down the road with a bag of garbage. Neighborhoods, what does it mean to have to live in close proximity to your neighbor? When you have to smell his cooking and hear his music. And he says, I ain't even got it up that loud, man. I can't even like really hear the music because you live right next to, this is, these are issues, this is, this is a part of our life, this is, makes up the fabric of our lives. What we have to suck up, what we have to, how we have to make space for each other. Well, we have to, do you understand what I mean? We, we can't go off to a bigger space, we have to, or go find somewhere else to live. I'm trying to paint about it in a human way. Not airy fairy pie in the sky, just in a very practical way. Why do you need to have paintings? You need to have paintings not just to put on a wall, but the painting becomes a living and breathing thing. We talk about it, we refer to it, we talk about the loquat tree that's behind that house where we used to go and steal them on our way to school. And Mr. So-and-so that used to complain and chase us away until our children know the story by heart. Yeah, mama, if you tell that story one more time about the low cuts, well, that's all right. Because one day you won't be there anymore and you know what they'll say to their children? My mama used to tell me there was a low tree behind this thing. And while they're telling the story, the tears are in their eyes because mama told that story and told that story and told that story. Until now it's woven into the fabric. And instead of somebody fighting at your death to have your whatever, they want that painting. Why? Not because of the painting. The stories have been infused in that painting. But if you're still finding paintings that match your drapes, it ain't gonna happen. You don't even know where your drapes are gonna be in 15 years. What is with this, this drapes business? What it, what it, I think that we should find every interior designer, we should string them up. <laughs> the story is our lives. Do you understand that? Because when I came in the door, people said, well, why I want that house? I don't live in that neighborhood. I ain't my house. In my mama's house, I ain't even got no neighbors living around there. Y'all got any pictures with my um, mom, two girls, three boys, and a cat? Because I've got like two girls, three boys. I don't understand. I'm laughing at them, but I'm laughing at me too, because my family does it. They didn't collect art. I came on the scene as an artist. My family didn't collect art. I'm still having to convince them as I'm having to convince you. You wait till I die. Do you understand what I'm saying? You can buy art on terms, but you can buy anything they want. The question is whether or not you value it. It's not about whether you can afford it. You can afford anything you want. I had a guy walk up to me. I was painting at Camden on on Sunday, and I was painting a picture of a little boy. And he came by and he stood there, big man. And he said, um, I like that. That's nice, I like that. And I said, oh, thank you, you know. And he was quiet for a little while, and then he went into this thing, and he told me about his son. 13 years old, gang banging away, mothers out there in the light. I don't know what to do. 
I thought he was looking at the little boy saying, great artist. Well, maybe he was saying, I like that. But he was doing more than that. He was remembering when his child was, beyond, was beneath the age he is now, where he's, now he's saying, if I don't do something soon, I'm going to lose him. He's going to die. And I know it, and I'm standing here, and I don't know what to do. I have artists saying to me, well, Sharon, you think there's stories that you're telling about, you know, you really think that helps you sell pictures? I don't really think that people that want to buy pictures want to know that. Oh, well, you keep painting about what you're painting about there. And I'm going to keep doing this, but I'm telling you that in some ways, if you choose well, it'll help save your life, your sanity, the kind of environment that you create at home. I had a woman come up to me on Saturday. I'm out there painting. And she said, are you Sharon Wilson? I said, yes. She said, you see my son right here? He's three years old. I said, oh, hi, how are you doing? She said, when my son was born, they put him in an incubator. And while I laid in the hospital, I looked up on the wall, and there was your painting of a mother that was bathing a child. She said, and all I wanted, I looked at that picture day and day, and all I wanted to know that he would get well enough one day for me to give him a bath myself. And I looked at that painting, and I said a prayer, and I looked at it, and I looked at it. You wonder about the power of imagery? It can be a powerful thing if you choose well. And a thing that after you have enjoyed it, you have the joy to pass it on, because it isn't diminished by time. You understand? It's not diminished by time. So it's yours now. It gets passed on with its stories. It gets passed on with its stories. It gets passed on with its stories. Nobody wants Mama's China anymore. Don't want it. I don't know what happened in the world. Don't want a sugar bowl. Sugar bowl? I don't want no sugar bowl. You got any Louis Vuitton? Well, there's nothing of your lineage, there's nothing of your collective story tied up in Louis. Louis's got to come up with something new every season. Louis's not stupid. So if you don't want the china anymore, that's okay, but we have to replace it with something. So what I'm suggesting as I close tonight, is there one more slide? Oh. Next category, sorry. Before I get away from the neighborhood category, was there anything else? Any questions? Yes. You mentioned um, the social commentary in Bermuda. Yeah. Have you considered now doing a series of paintings of the less attractive parts of Bermuda? I mean, I'm talking about, I noticed that there was a picture there with a what seemed to the church in the background. Was that St. Monica's? That was actually done by, um, yeah, no, yeah, what's it called? Gleebert, yeah. You mentioned the normal contrast of the movie as well, in the arms picture. Uh -huh. What about a series of pictures of the homeless, um, St. Monica's Mission, the Glebelands? Uh, I noticed the picture of the houses was probably up in the Glebelands area. Have you considered a series? I've of done pictures? some things on that. I think that. Um, one of the concerns that I have um, is going into certain neighborhoods to take pictures. I think, I think we have to be really intelligent today, where, where and how. It's not so much what I'm doing as what I may be perceived as doing. So um, with a telephoto lens, um, um, I can get certain kinds of shots, and yes, I am concerned about neighborhoods that are hugely changing, um, the face of which are hugely changing. I would like to document it 
And it's such a strange time because I feel like there's so many things that I really, really, really need to paint about. I feel like I can't afford to sleep. I feel like I should be doing this and doing this and doing this, but yes. And I'm gonna try to at least document it with the camera so that I can paint about it when I'm ready to. Just one last question. Yeah. Again, it's like, you know, I, I, I did the Court Street thing with the camera a lot of years ago and had somebody come and rescue me from it. You know, Sharon, Sharon said, no, 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 no. So, you know, I take your point. I may be able to shoot on a Sunday morning or whatever, but yes, I will keep that in mind. This next category is titled, What We Bring to the Table. I, I thought a lot about what we bring to the table and um, decided that I wanted to do a series of paintings. And then I would ask the people that sit at this table what, what they felt they brought to the table, the proverbial table, the, the table of life. What do, you, what do you bring? What do you bring and what do you what do you freely offer? It's really funny, because you hit 30, at 40, 50, 60, 70, in increments of 10. You start to ask the question. You start to reevaluate in a big way. What, am, am, am I living the kind of life I want to live? Am I, am I open-minded? Do I bring a listening ear? Do I bring calm, or do I just, do I just, get in the mix and mix it up some more, you know, people mix it up, you know, like drama, mix it up. Or do I, do I bring a common element in my life? And I have as my first model uh, one of my students and a fellow artist, and I gave her a bowl. And, and the question of whether or not she's coming to, to to ask something at the table or whether she's coming to bring something to the table. It's just a very interesting way to think about it. Again, if I didn't say that the theme is what do you bring to the table, you would just assume it was um, a portrait of a woman. And so it does change the context and it does um, allow each of us to pause and think about what we bring. Um, in the course of our, our daily life. So that, that is a separate category of works. And this I added as my last. And the reason I put it there is because I wouldn't have you believe that I don't love still life or don't like landscape. But I just feel right now, where, where I stand right now, I just feel like it's such a critical time that um, when I put together what I have learned and the time I've set aside to think about it and to try to chart a course and not just produce art but try to speak through art to you that I don't have time right now to paint another picture about surf. That I don't have time, that time is is of the essence and that if I have an opportunity to send out a clarion call that might wake some of us up or I know that my art can never reach everybody. I'm not Walmart. I'm not producing a generic product, underpants, where everybody needs underpants so I can sell a million of them. The only people I can ever reach at any point in my life as an artist are those people whose experiences somehow touch my experience. And then we, at least for that period of time, until we shift and change and evolve into something else, we understand each other then. But people whose experience, if they're far different from mine, then they may, they may not understand or be able to value what I do. So I don't try to paint for everybody. But I try to paint with integrity, and I try not to take my, my audience for granted. 
And I thank you for your time and your attention this evening. Thank you very much. Are there any questions? No? Wow. Are you awake? <laughs> <laughs> All right. Please join me in thanking Mrs. Sh Ms. Sharon Wilson for what I thought was a really amazing, interesting lecture. I think it was thank you. Thank you for having me. I've, um, I'm sorry. No. I, I've, uh, I'm not sure if you realize um, my mom would have been your neighbor as a child. And um, I've known about your art all of my life, but this is the first time that I've ever had a chance to really get insight into why you create what you create. And I'm sure for everybody who's known and appreciated your art for these years, this is a particularly um, really enjoyable lecture. Um, very appropriate also with our Heritage Month theme, Heritage Through the Eyes of the Artist. Um, I would like to also, um, Mrs. Tanek, my colleague, is here. Um, did you want to mention anything about Heritage Month? Um, you want me to talk about what went back or what's coming? Uh, what's coming. Oh, okay. Is that fine? Uh, I, too, enjoyed Ms. Wilson. Thank you. I, too, enjoyed your um, interpretation, the wisdom behind your work. Um, made it so much more meaningful for us as we look at art. Well, I hope, Ms. Tanik, and uh, this is one, that we will, this will not be a once a year thing, that we will find ways to come together and talk about art and through art, and so that you become more comfortable um, saying how you feel about what you're looking at or asking some of the questions of why, don't, why aren't you getting, why isn't a country producing some of the art that you want and value, and why is it that in the middle of all this madness your musicians are not writing serious songs with serious lyrics about what's happening. It's almost like we're paralyzed. We're almost just, we just don't know what to do. We're just paralyzed right now, reeling from it. So I'm hoping that we will have other, it may not be a venue as big as this, uh, but that we will find opportunities. And I have a new, an e-newsletter. I have a, a sheet right there if you would sign it on your way out if you'd like to be on the list. And then we can notify you as to uh, when and where we might choose to meet. And then I'm going to have an open house. I might, I might as well do my little plug first. Sure. I'm going to have an open house. And it's going to be my first open house. Because I always felt that my, my house was too small to do that. You know how you feel like, eh, it's too small. Eh. It's like, get over yourself. The house is the house. If you come to see the art, you come to see the art. If you get there late, you stand outside. <laughs> I'm just joking. But I'm going to have an open house, and it's going to be, what is it really? Sunday. This Sunday? The, the, is it the 19th? <laughs> okay, okay, okay. Yes, it's this month, huh? Oh, good. We'll send them with the Yeah, okay, we'll send it back out. It'll be from 3 to 5, and it'll be a Sunday afternoon. And what I'm encouraging you to do is just to come and to look. You have to get accustomed to coming and looking without the fear that somehow somebody's going to force you at gunpoint before you leave to buy a painting. I don't do that until you visited me five or six times. But the first couple of times, I don't usually do that to people. But you have to get accustomed to coming and looking at it. And then you have to get accustomed to asking questions without worrying about sounding stupid. You have to get over and past that. And then you have to get to the point where you call up and say, Sharon, you have anything new? You're going to be home? Can I just pop by for like 50? Yeah. And then you just come in and you look and see, and you get accustomed to that. So open house is going to be the first of what I hope will become a regular thing for me. 
And that's my opportunity and my attempt to stop being afraid of you. That's why I'm going to have open houses. Excellent. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe um, I can I just add, sorry, sorry, Kim, I can just add that um, during, this, during this Heritage Month, Heritage to the Eyes of the Artists, Sharon Wilson provides us with the, with the actual artist, being able to look into her art and into her life story as such. We have two other events that are coming up. There's uh, a music at Shine's Club, um, and that is being able to appreciate your median young musicians. Um, and that's the night of the 21st. These events would not happen and certainly wouldn't happen with the degree of success that they do without their valuable input. Uh, Mr. James Smith, um, Doreen Aubrey, uh, Ellen Hollis, there you are, <laughs> Andrew Birmingham, and Lucy Sperling and my assistant, Vinay Sims, I really appreciate your assistance with these lectures. Um, I'd just like to also mention that our next lecture is going to be on the 11th of June. It's a Saturday, and it's Portugal Day uh, from the Azores to Bermuda. And that's going to be a really fun event at Victoria Park from 2 o'clock to 5 o'clock. We're going to have an opportunity to, we're going to have demonstrations on how to make malasadas, how to do Portuguese folk dancing. We're going to have some lectures by Dr. Tessera, um, live music. So please come out and support that event. Uh, we'll be advertising it, but it's also in the, uh, the season brochure, which you can collect from our office or go online, www.communityandculture.bm. And, um, anything? No. Okay. Uh, was there one other question? I'm sorry. I do for adults. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. So, how do you get your information on that? Just, just call me. Yeah. Call me up, yeah. yeah. Great. Okay. Thank you again. And um, please enjoy the rest of your Heritage Month. Uh, please feel free to enjoy the refreshments in the, um, in the lobby. And we hope to see you at our next event. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.